Greetings, one and all. This is Lloyd Brown giving full endorsement to the station with integrity, the station with a difference. Remember, me tell you, Lloyd Brown says so. Full endorsement. Stock in promotion, Royal Blend Radio. We now stop till we drop. Zane, Zane, Black. Why not tune in to the SPRB Radio Podcast Zoom Experience with 10 Star General? And share a man, share a man, share a man, share a man, share a man. Right, today uh, we have Dr. Tony Grant, who is on our show today. Um, I'm going to bring in Sharon, we're going to do things a little bit different today. Sharon, can you unmute? Yeah, me. I'm, 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 I am. Not oh, Sharon Bentley, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, shame. <laughs> Sharon Bentley from Germany, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you for being here. She's one of our supporters. Introduce yourself, tell people who you are, and yeah, introduce yourself first and foremost. My name is Sharon Bentley Pike, um, the CEO of Vibes Peace Freedom music promotion mm -hmm. and a supporter of Stockade Radio and SPRB Corporation. Yeah. And um, she, she, Sharon Bentley has been a big supporter of us over the last, I would say, 15, 20 years and she's here today. She's gonna to be introducing some of the people who we may be seeing for the first time. Who can you see in our attendance list? Yeah, at the moment we have uh, DJ Maestro, Vivian Montgomery, oh, Rankin Ann, and Anto oh, Antonio is here, yeah. Yeah, and ranking and so far. Oh, te okay. also Techno Spark. Mm -hmm. Welcome, everybody. Or maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, okay. So, thank Hello? you to everyone who is here. Thank you, Sharon. Yes. Um, thank you to everyone who is here at the moment. Sharon Mango. Yes, sir. We have only from uh, Sharon's in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon Mango, introduce yourself. Yes, greetings one and all. I'm so happy to see a good number of people in here, hoping some more will tune in. But my name is Sharon Mango. I always say, let me correct this. I am the original Sharon Mango. Welcome to... Original. <laughs> no? Original, original, original. But thank you all for coming today. We have, oh, sorry, representing SBRB Radio, a Royal Blend Productions. It's not about me today. We are going to be speaking on a very important topic today that is plaguing our society. We are so grateful to have Dr. Tony Grant, who works in the field. I want to say this, she works in the field of mental health and well-being. Um, she's not an expert, but she will be definitely just touching on the subject of mental health. It's a big issue. It's something Ten Star and I have spoken about many times. Um, and while we have lost many to mental health, there's so many degrees of mental health. And we want people to have a better understanding of this is what I would call a, 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 it's a pandemic. I feel it's a pandemic because it's rampant. Yeah. I, I would definitely say it's a, it's a pandemic. Again, Dr. Tony Grant is, she's not an expert. When I say expert, you know, in, 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 in the large realm. So we just want people to take what they can take from this and have a better understanding of how, why, and what mental health is. And, you know, there may be people around us. This is a subject that's very dear to my heart as I've lost quite a few people um, to this mental health pandemic. So um, again, welcome all. Um, 
Dr. Tony Grant, thank you so much for coming on our show. Can thank you hear you us? Having me. Yes. Thank you, thank you Kevin. Okay, again, I'd let everybody know that you're not like an expert, but you work in the field and you can definitely open people's minds about what is happening in our society today. So um, we'll be asking you a series of questions and um, you can give us your insight. Since you do work in the field, what you've witnessed for yourself and um, yeah, that's about it. Cause I'm gonna keep talking, 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 but thank you again for being here. I, I, I think to, to, today, um, I, I want it to be more of a masterclass. So I, I want Dr. Grant to really educate us on, you know, the issue of mental health. Um, I saw that in 2017, that every 15 minutes, there is a suicide that occurs either in the United States or whether it's in the UK. Um, and we're experiencing more and more deaths now in 2022, um, where they said at least every 20 minutes, uh, there is a death here in the UK or whether it's in the United States. So more and more people were experiencing uh, uh, committing suicides. I know that there's many layers to mental health. And from what I've been reading and trying to brush up on mental health, there is a tendency that we misconstrue mental health with mental disorder. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let you just chime in and just give us a masterclass on, on this issue of mental health and what we need to know about it. And I don't want it to just be about the causes, but what can we do to even just raise the awareness or bring about a solution to how can we turn the tide around if we can do that at all? Okay, so um, once again, thank you for having me. And um, even though um, there are many experts in the field, it's hard to pin it to being an expert in the field, even when you do have a degree in mental health. And that's because it's ever changing and we have to really be aware of that. Um, today, what I mostly want to stick because it is so broad and there's so many things that um, go into mental health and mental disorder because they are distinguished as two separate. Um, when we speak about um, mental health, um, generally we are speaking, and I'm gonna speak in general because I'm, in, I'm going to in, take the time to include as much um, of our population. And when I, what I mean by that is every culture Okay, so across the worldwide globe, general um, depression and anxiety is something that we all can suffer from at any given times in our lives due to um, maybe post-traumatic stress or whatever environmental, what we're going through. And so, um, which is different than from other like mental health disorders that may be, um, what we um, developed over the years. I don't want to say born with because there is a diagnose, um, a diagnosis um, that are given to children, but if they will not diagnose a child until they're at least five years old. So I can't say born with, right? There's things that are noticed when we're talking about mental health disorders, but the, the doctors, the experts, are even careful to diagnose a child before five years old. We can, you know, like kind of like sugarcoat around it to get the child that um, they may need some medication or such like that, but they don't want to diagnose a person. And then a lot of, um, also when it comes to mental health, people can develop that through years. So it's not something you actually born with and then that's what, you know, you're stuck with and, you know, like have this label. So um, that's the difference. Um, but speaking generally, when we talk about um, 
depression. We're talking about depression and anxiety, almost going in hand in hand. Okay. And um, just going to be a little bit more specific on that general is um, let's take environmental for um, example. Um, I believe that when it comes to like environmental um, situations like disasters, I have my friends on right now. Thank you, friends, for joining. I have some of my friends, my friends, Sister Vivian, and such like that, which is um, we were actually touched on that this morning about the environmental. For example, what's going on in Puerto Rico, how that affects the mind. You are used to living in a certain lifestyle. And now because of a natural disaster, your, um, you know, your whole mindset is thrown off. That would bring on depression and, and, and anxiety in that form. Um, also relationship wise, right? Um, when it comes to relationships and dealing with another person, you're dealing with a whole different human being. And now you have to mesh your ideas and such with another person. Okay, that's the mental shift right there. <laughs> so you have to learn to either compromise or sometimes it just, you know, you just can't get there. So there's many levels of um, depression that can happen, you know, that can occur through us as human beings. And like I said, it's all of us, it's not just um, a particular person. Um, another thing what I just wanted, I just want to throw it out there for everybody. And then that means I have talking about culturally. I work with people culturally from India, from Asia, from Jamaica, from Africa, especially talking about the men. They don't even want to recognize that they're going through depression. And that's why they react or act on certain things. Pardon? You're speaking to me? No, go, go ahead. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'll kind of... Okay. So when we touch on that, quite <laughs> difficult to really pin that down for the simple fact that you have to be able to acknowledge that you, you know, you're going through certain things, certain emotions in your, in your body, in your mind that would bring on the depression. But it's, it's really quite difficult when I work along with the men from, mm -hmm. so I'm dealing with things, I'm dealing with the cultural side, right? Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, men, men don't cry, men don't, you know, we don't go through that. We got to hold down the fort and it's wrong. It's totally wrong. And, it, it, you know, it's a throw off. And um, I think that we have to appreciate other cultures, but also be able to embrace that um, this is not something that's going to change overnight um, because of the, um, the the amount of time, the years and the, you know, the, the, the years of just like a, a brainwashing, right? Because many cultures, you're here, oh, you're a man, you're not supposed to cry when something happens, you've got to stand up, man, all of this stuff, and then it goes into that. That's the wrong way to um, raise our men to think that way. But it is a big deal. And when I speak to different cultures, Jamaican culture, Africa, they don't even want to talk about it. So it takes, it takes time. It takes a breakdown. It takes a um, constant meeting with the person so that they can trust me in order. To, and people like me, I'm not the only one. I'm not the savior of the world, okay? But, you know, people like me that we're able to um, break through the ice so that we can get to the real problems. The beauty of that is once we do break through, there is such a shift in um, the male perspective of mental health and what they need to do. And relationships improve with the wife, with the children, work. You know, someone's coming home angry every day. They don't know why they're angry. And nobody wants to be around them. But now because of therapy, you know, they're able to deal with and really be in touch with their feelings. So I think I'm more... A, a broader term is better than to just like be specific, at least for today, because I hope that this is we're just touching on today so that we can continue to grow and we can get into specific maybe at a later time. But this is, um, you know, uh, kind of like an opening of what we need to deal with. And so, one more thing I'll add and then I'll stop talking. We've got to think about the women in this too, because we're suffering alongside our men. Okay, and so a lot of cultures, um, even the women, even if they recognize depression in their men, or they're also suffering also, it's difficult to talk about, like they can't go and 
say that to the man, the man's ready to box them in the head with the culture that I deal with. So the women, we have to recognize and appreciate the women also, but they're suffering alongside a lot of the women in different cultures and say, no, 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 I, I want mental health, but I don't, I want the therapy, but I don't want him to know I'm getting it. So it's broader than what we would really think, um, but it's very important that we recognize that and appreciate that we all go through it at some time. It's not anything to be ashamed of. It's something to embrace so that we can grow as a society and um, take it right back down to our households and our homes. So, so let, let, let me come back to, to one of the, because we're, we're also seeing more and more suicides amongst young people um, in our society, especially in the black community, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, why would you say that in 2022, there's such a spike in, in suicides occurring in our community at the moment? Um, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, from my experience, I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of things that, go, that, that, that really take place in that. Um, sometimes teens, it could be, I mean, we, we saw like a spike in, in suicide when it came to the LGBT community, right? Because the, the, the teens felt like they was not being heard or, you know, it's a shameful thing and stuff like that. So we saw a huge spike, especially in the town that I worked in because of that reason. But there's other reasons that go into it. Um, just being able um, to communicate with families, a lot of things people are going through and they feel ashamed to actually speak about it. I'm talking about the young people, right? And then they have their peers that they are, they have their group of friends that they were confiding more than family, right? And um, I, I, I want to um, just Im impress upon, and it sounds strange, but it happens to be true. My experience, I've definitely seen it in, in, my, in my lifetime and with my son Daniel's age group, right? Where one friend dies for whatever reason and the other friend is like, yo, I'm gonna join you in a few weeks and actually joins the person. So um, it's not just one part of people that kill themselves because they're depressed, it, it's also going into bonds. If you know anything about like um, gang members, they, they will kill and they will be killed in a gang because of the unity they feel in that gang. And so that brings it on. So it's not just one thing that all of them are because they're depressed. There's, that is definitely a bigger part of it. Right. But when we're talking about teens, we're talking about teens of today are very fearless. And that energy and that, um, you know, when you're around somebody for a, a, a long period of time, spirits are transferable. So you've got an energy, for, you know, even if you didn't think that way, sometimes you do begin to think that way. That, yeah, you know, maybe they'll be better off without me, right? right. Then, then people, the, the, the children, adults also, but children, speaking to children, they start to think that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so um, we're not, children are very impressionable today. They're very strong, they're very opinionated, but I feel as us as parents, not only as parents, because sometimes our children, most of the time our children are gonna come to us. Mm -hmm. They're going to go to an outside source, even if it's an adult, somebody else who sounds like that they're agreeing with them. Um, you'll hear um, the types of reasons why they feel that they no longer have to be on the earth. Maybe they feel useless, mm -hmm. right? That's a big thing. Oh, maybe they'll be better off without me. And they take stuff to the extreme. And um, we live in a wicked world. We live in a wicked fallen world, right? And that's the reality of our lives right now. And just being able, so what we have to really do is let our children no, and it's difficult because they're rude. Sometimes it's hard to tell, you know, I'm there for you and they're telling you, oh, F you, because it's happened to me. And I have to smile while a kid's telling me that, right? Or their attitude stinks. But 
But we as the adults that know better have to be able to stand strong like a tree, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like they say, a song's on stand up, song yeah. on yeah. and really just let the child know that we are unchangeable. We're not going to change just because you're angry. We're not going to change because, you know, your friends told you that we would act a certain way and so you've got it in your head. It's, it's, it's a peeling away layers and layers. But that is a big deal where we're not reaching our children because it takes effort. It takes a lot of effort. They shut down. They're not, um, they tune us out because they find that the, their friend's word, the friend's um, environment are more valuable than their own. Uh, Sharon, any questions? Uh, I, I have a thousand and one questions, but I'm going to come to you before I say anything. Um, one thing I would say is that this is not a subject we can have in, a, in an hour or two conversation and talk about the length and breadth of this subject. So we're going to take our time with it. I want to apologize also for the audio the audio is not great at the moment but we're going to have a part one part two part three to this subject because it is plaguing our society so um sharon anything you would like to add okay so um i want to touch back on the subject of depression um based on what you said of course there's many layers of the de depression um let's talk about we were talking about the male aspect in depression um i've lost a, a good few male figures you know friends and family alike why do you think that they look at they don't really address their depression they just angry from your perspective why do you think it is that way is it is it just the embarrassment is it that they don't even realize what's happening to them, you know what I mean? Where they get to a point where oh, nobody's listening. They're not saying anything, but they're in their head, they're thinking nobody's listening, nobody cares. Why do you think that is? Um, once again, um, I would say it's um, quite based on a cultural, and when we say culture, we're not just talking about country to country. House has culture. Your own home has a, has a, has a culture that you kind of like to used to, right? And so um, when it comes to um, the male and the depression, it's not being addressed. And it, sometimes it starts at a, um, it, many times it starts from a younger age, okay? So um, the male is brought up at, to not be in touch with their feelings, okay? So it's really quite difficult as they grow up and you keep on, you know, that's in your mind. That's a brainwashing, that's a mindset, right? And um, it's really quite difficult for men to express themselves. I'm not gonna say all men, but many men that come from this environment where it's a macho thing, so they're not in touch with their feelings. They feel um, sissy-ish, if, if, if you will, if there's a word, um, to actually speak on it. It is an embarrassment. So rather than think about it from a, um, a, a positive aspect, it's more negative, right? So in that, even trying to have a conversation with your children or with the wife, and things don't sound... Um, the way how the male would want it to sound, instead of talking it through, it's better for them to react so that they don't look stupid. But it's from their perspective. It's not real, but it's from their perspective because, you know, men are the stronger vessel, as we know, and we accept this. But um, in being strong, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't cry. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be in touch with your feelings. Um, you have to be in touch with your feelings. And if you don't understand those feelings and you don't uh, either have someone to talk through those feelings or you yourself don't understand it, it can be confusing even to an adult male. 
And so the reaction that comes across is sometimes egotistical or um, violent or angry. It's better to be angry, right? To throw people off. When you see an angry person, I've seen many angry men. I'm not going to talk to you when you're at that level of anger, right? And so um, where it throws you off so you don't want to deal with what the real problem is because you're on, I want to see them explode, right? Um, speaking even more personal with my own three boys, I have three very strong young men, strong, 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 different personalities, but very strong. Same thing, you know, Daniel, my oldest, yeah, you could kind of take on, he'll, he'll, he'll speak sometimes, he, he speaks all the time. I don't want to raise a monster. So him, he will speak. He's going to tell you from a young age at five, six years old, mommy, you hurt my feelings. And I'll be like, okay, let's talk about that. So Daniel, now that he's 27, he's very, um, he's in touch with his feelings. He has no problems expressing himself. Right? Matthew also was raised in that way. Where you go, you know, every child is different. You're going to catch him at the right moment, but he understands his feelings, but when he's angry, he'll take that moment and go, um, you know, sit aside, think about it, and come back. He's very good at that. <laughs> My baby Joshua, he's he's the one that's like, oh, rah, 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 everything is on a thousand, right? So <laughs> some two different males from a from a personal perspective, where it's a constant conversation. Joshua, everything is zero to a thousand. Everything is, a, and we got to talk through that. A lot of things went into that why he is that way. Again, environmental. But at the same time, we who are able to curtail that, we need to be able to do that because then the men grow up, the young boys grow up with this mindset that this is the way to handle situations, right? And, and it's, I, I told my son, gosh, my God, if you was not my son and you acted like this out there, I'd be scared. I said, but because you are mine, it's, it's not happening. So if I feel that way, how would somebody else feel? Because it is a um, defense mechanism to keep you off. He's not, he's the sweetest kid. He's really a sweet, but that's a defense. So Sharon, going back to your point, this is why the males act. I try to give you three like aspects of this is why males do act like that because it's not like that. They're, it it, it wards you off so that you don't have to deal with the real issues. Let me, let me ask you this question. Let me, let me say this. Do you think, again, there's a, an astronomical spike in again we're touching back on the male species there is an astronomical heights in the abuse Abu mm -hmm. abusing women has been long-standing again based on what you just now said you know it's because they don't know how to express themselves but what I have been noticing is that these fathers are, if they're not able to get to the women and there's children, then they kill the children. You, you understand what I'm saying? You've seen it, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. There's been an astronomical amount of killings with the fathers that are actually taking the children out. They didn't beat the women enough. So let me just take my, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do away with the kids. And then after everything's done, they're like, well, I, I don't know what happened. I just snapped. Right. Is that depression? Is that, I think the word I'm thinking, I think what I'm really trying to get to is, do you think it's a society thing because of what's happening today? A portion of what you said, stressed on the point, it's probably something long seated, right? Yes. From way back, they never got to express their feelings, but it's just of right. lately that's been really a concern to me that these innocent little children are being taken out by a parent because they're not able to deal with the world. They're not able to, I don't know. I don't know. What, do, what is your opinion on that? Because I know that you've seen this in your area. You've seen, right. you've been to a lot of broken homes where you see the child's been abused and, and, Mike, can you touch on that? Yes. Um, when it comes to, like, like, children see, right, in the environment from a young age, and that's what they learn as they grow up. 
grow up, right? Yeah, um, right. 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 And this is why um, if you're coming from a Christian background, you always say train up a child in the way they should go. And when they grow old, they will not depart from it, right? So mm -hmm. it, 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 it is that um, biblical principle that a lot of people miss. Because you, it, it, if your child is seeing the husband or the father beat up on the month, verbally, it usually starts with a verbal, the little stuff, right? And then they're seeing it escalate and escalate. That's what they're seeing. That's what they're learning, right? And um, to be fair, to be fair, when you have a child that has witnessed abuse from the father to the mother or to be fair, either or, all right, because it's not just man, mm -hmm. but they see that there's only two things that's going to happen with that child. It's either they're going to grow up and, you know, through their experience and say, you know, I saw this abuse and I will not take that on because I saw it didn't work for me or they're going to take that on and they're going to say, well, I turned out okay. There's only two things that can happen, right? So um, it's got a lot to do. It, it, this uh, uh, um, abuse that gets start that 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 it started and the and, and the males take on that as a um, a way of dealing with with any given situation, even simple situations. Yes, it is a form of, it definitely, it falls under the umbra umbrella of um, general um, depression and anxiety, which we all fall under, okay? So, um, but it's how they deal with it that's the real issue. So this abuse, and, de and depending on how um, us women sometimes, or the, the one that's out, the victim sometimes, we don't make it any better because we take the, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. And then maybe a day or two later, the conversation changes. Well, you know, maybe I could change it. Maybe you'll change. Oh, he didn't really need it. We just try to make excuses as to why the person we love has done this thing and they didn't mean it, right? But the point is that whole environment needs to be addressed. It's not just him. It's her too. It's the partner because we are raising children. And children are not going to stay a child forever, no matter what we might think. Mm -hmm. And they come up and they start to um, have their own perspective of what relationships look like. Mm -hmm. And um, we as human beings, we always try to um, seek for pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Mm -hmm. That's just what it is. We seek for pleasure and the avoidance of pain. So. We don't want to think about that negative. We're always trying to get back to that homeostasis of a happier time, a better feeling, right? And so when we talk about the level of abuse in, um, you know, maybe male against female or whatever the case may be, and you hear the term blackout, I, black, I don't know what happened. That's when you're at the level of you definitely need take it up a notch and the family is in a dangerous situation because if you black out to the point where you don't even know what happened, that's a different level. That's not just, you know, anxiety and depression. It's mm -hmm. deeper than that. And we need to be able to recognize that and, you know, appreciate that fact. We see somebody depressed. We just don't want to walk away from that. Because sometimes it is a matter of talking it out, talking it out. When you talk to people, that's when you're able to um, get to the bigger picture of what's really going on um, in, in a situation. And you'll find terrible, terrible, terrible situations as to, uh, or stories as to why people act out the way they act out. It could be going back to, Chronologically, the age that the abuse happened, I don't want to get technical with you guys. I want this to be like a conversation, so I don't want to get book smart, but you know, um, the, 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 the truth of the matter is chronologically, if the abuse happened 
at the age of seven years old. And it was never addressed, never addressed at seven year, years old. Although chronologically the man keeps on, you know, you, you, you're getting up there. That was never addressed. So the fact that it was never addressed, that's always your go-to when anything happens, right? Because you're trying to get out of feeling that way at the time that that particular um, abuse took place. You may have watched your mother being killed or, you know, watched the loved one being killed. I mean, I, I, I work with um, people and I'm um, friends with people that that has happened to, right? Where a friend saw his father push his grandmother. He fell back, she busted her head. Now this is, this is a gangster situation, okay? So they came from a gangster life, they're from Puerto Rico. Um, and um, he's, all his life he saw abuse, 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 abuse. Everything is like a, a gang fight. That's the way he was raised. Um, the man was so angry that he would come home and take it out on his family. Now he's a leader of a gang, right? So he's used to killing, that's not a problem. But even dealing with the children, it was always like abuse, abuse, abuse. Um, he came into the house to speak to the, 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 his mother, which is my friend's grandmother. And um, while he's talking to the grandmother, he didn't like what she said. So he pushed her back. When he pushed her back, she fell back and busted her head and blood started to gush out. My friend at the time was only six years old. His go-to was to pick up his dad's gun and he shot his dad and killed him. Seven years old, mm. okay? Mm. That friend right now is 53 years old and he's still struggling because he doesn't want to face that pain, mm. okay? And so even like talking with him or dealing with him or acting with him, I had to cut him off because I'm like, you need help. You need help now. You know, you have a son that he and I basically were raising because he didn't know how to handle that son. And so I was constantly being that mother for the son. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to this son, I'm talking, you know, don't let this bother you, get help, get outside. And I had to tell him in the end, you know, the alcohol is not going to help. You need to address this issue. He never got over killing his father. And he, he doesn't regret it. He's like, he deserved it. He killed, he laid my grandma for. So those are issues that will send you into an abusive city. He's, he's beat up women. He sees nothing wrong with it, mm -hmm. you know? So it's really serious that if we don't address it, it goes deeper than just general depression. It's, that's not just general depression. You've got to get help for that. It wasn't his fault at six years old because he's still a child, but that's what he grew up in, mm -hmm. seeing people get killed. He ended up killing his own dad. Mm -hmm. So that's just like one example. I have many examples of when we don't address these issues where the abuse becomes the norm. It starts with the pulling of the hair, little nasty things coming out of the person's mouth and the one, oh, he loves me, oh, he lo no, he don't love you, he need help. That's what it is, he needs help. So it's going to get worse and worse as time goes on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I want I want to come to to I, I I want to go back in time to a time where there was unresolved issues. For instance, let's just pick a topic of racism, mm -hmm. right? Racism has never in my lifetime in 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 my era in time been acknowledged by the perpetrators of what they've been doing, which has been passed down by, we would say the ancestors or whatever from that particular race, right? So for instance, in the UK, it's in stealth mode. They would never acknowledge the issue of racism. Yeah, but yet, those who are at the receiving end of racism are expected to just get on with it. Over the years, if you are continually going through these issues of unresolved racism, people saying, like for instance, I'll give you an instance. I worked for a company for like 25 odd years, right? 
and I worked with a supervisor who was clearly racist. And he said to me, was going to get a shotgun and shoot me, right? So my stubborn head said, go for it, right? So long and short of it all, there was this back and forth. It went to management. And um, before management, management is telling me, are you sure you went through this? When this man clearly said certain words to me. And she wanted me to change my report that I had against him, right? And I'm just showing you a simple case of what I went through, right? She says, well, you know, if you do not change your report, you know, this can go against you. And this beautiful pension you're going to get when you retire, you may not get it. Yeah, that's what she said to me. So I said to myself, okay, let me include her in my report. So I included her in the report and said, you know, I reported to her that this was a racist situation and she's trying her best to save her colleague so that I don't report this guy in long and short of it all, right? When she saw what I had written, she had said to me that she apologizes for her uh, part in it, right? Now, it got resolved in that the guy apologized to me, but that's not always the case in these situations. We have this non-tenant attitude where they say, you know, in the UK, there is no racism. They have come a long way. There are a lot of people at the receiving end of racism. There are some people who cannot take the fact that, of, of what they've been through, right? And actually commit suicide. Case in point, again, I want to come to a colleague that I worked with who worked in the signals. I'm not sure if I should be saying all this stuff, but I do want to say it, right? Right? And he came into work, and to me, to the naked eye, he seemed sound and in good humor, right? He worked in the signal, so his work was very, very demanding. And then we came in one day, and we found out that he had committed suicide. He hanged himself. And I thought, I never even knew this guy had a problem. You know what I mean? And when we found out what it was about, is things that me and you go through every day, which is never, ever recognized. Surely that is going to turn people, especially if it's unresolved, it's going to push people to the edge. Whether it's relationships that we were talking about earlier, because you said men don't like to talk about mental health and, you know, what they're going through because it's this macho thing, you know. I think there's a lot of hidden situations that men go through that we are expected to just get on with it and, and just whatever it is without looking at the dynamics. Because I'm sure if you put a microscope in a person's life, you would find a thousand and one different things that you could have resolved. Am I making sense? Am I, to, am I talking? <laughs> yeah, no, you're, definitely making sense. you're definitely making sense of um, what you're saying. And um, again, um, issues have to be resolved. You, you, you handled yourself quite well in the situation where you got a resolve. That's not everybody's mm -hmm. story. That's not everybody's personality. Mm -hmm. And so they um, hold it in. Um, I will say this, um, in, any given, in any given situation, my situation, anybody's situation, um, I will tell you, um, hope deferred makes the heart sick, right? So we're always hoping to, for, for, for you know, the best in people in the best of situations. But when you're a hopeless person, not only can you kill, right? You have no problem killing yourself. Hopelessness is one of the worst. It's, it sounds like an easy, oh, I hope you have a good day. I hope, hope, hope. hope is big and hope is difficult. Okay. So um, if you don't get issues unresolved, issues resolved, and you get to that hopeless place, it may result in suicide. 
Mm-hmm. Even worse, it can result in hom- a homicide because at that point, you have nothing to lose. Be careful of the man that has nothing to lose. That's a dangerous man. <laughs> you know, you, 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 when you have nothing to lose, you'll go, you'll go anything. I always tell my children, I don't want you to be around no hopeless people. Because when they have nothing to lose, they will set you up. Because they have nothing to lose. They, 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 like they say, they have nothing to lose. You never want to be in that hopeless place. Right? Because it feels you can't talk to anybody. You can't, uh, um, you know, you're on your own. Um, maybe the world will be better without me. Um, even if I try to do anything, I mean, how are you going to find city hall? That's, that's the same because you're going up a big branch of people, right? But the word says you have to stand up even when you're standing alone. That's not always the issue, right? But at the same time, those things do need have do need to be addressed. And we have we as society have to set the standards for that to be embraced. Okay. Um, and and but but it but it's it, 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 it's it's quite serious. It's a loss of there's a loss of life. We're talking about a loss of life, and then you're sitting back saying shoulda, woulda, coulda, right? And um, I, re- I remember even just before COVID, like maybe five of m- my older son's friends took their life. And he happened to be with all of them that week that it ever happened. And he's coming to tell me and I'm like, okay, we have to do a better job of making sure that we're having those conversations because they're all cool, right? He's not yeah. thinking, well, Mom, I didn't know he was really going to do it. Hopelessness. Just because share hopelessness, they have a nice house, have nice parents, but they were at a hopeless psychological point in their life. And they feel like they can't turn towards anybody. And then when you get to the level where that's all you're thinking and you don't get anybody to um, help talk through that thing, then it becomes an, uh, an internal thing. That means even if you're at the level of depression, it's, it's deeper than that, right? about the psych the psychosocial of it even when someone talks to you outside of that you've already internally made up in your mind this is what i'm going to do right then there's no turning back right and so that's when you need the you know like the heavier boots on the ground to kind of like deal with that situation but we can't take it um lightly um, um, our motto and most mental health centers' mottos, and even myself just talking to people gen- generally, um, I'll hold your confidence. I will hold your confidence because that's what I'm supposed to do. It's this conf- confidential conversation. But if I get to the level where you say something that I, it sounds like you, you could take your life or others' life, that's when confidentiality is broken. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we have to be able to have keen ears to hear what others are saying because sometimes you have to not only look at what people are saying, you have to look at what they're not saying, right? And then sometimes you have to go back and revisit that person. How are you really doing? You know, and when you get that out of them, thank God, maybe you've helped them in a level where they're not feeling so much hopeless. They have a little bit of hope where you have something to work with. Mm-hmm. You have to be that vessel to be able to, um, you know, allow the spirit to move us in that way, to do that, because we don't do that. Well, we, we just simply open our mouth and we're hoping that whatever we say, it's going to make a connection with that person so that they don't feel that hopeless. But it's, it, 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 it's a very sad um, situation when you look at um, England and the races, even America and, you know, around the world racism right but let's take it a step even deeper sometimes it's not racism against white on black right it's shade color shade a lighter person against a darker person or a or a different culture you come from the same um, place but you come from different um, villages or different uh, communities then you have that to deal with. So it's not just that, and, and people are getting the same beat down, the stuff that you're describing, 
it's happened happening across the globe right and it's it, it doesn't um it, it it's with all it's with all it's with all so even though that's racism of what happened clear racism with black on white but it's also happening with the same color folks whether it be india asia you know just go around the globe and you'll see that but the point is the feeling that you exhibited that's the same feeling these people exhibit right not exactly it's the same thing like this is it's some type of oppression right and that's it yeah. hmm. you, you see what, what i see coming out of the u.s as as compared to the united kingdom is the fact that you have open racism which isn't being addressed and there clearly is a, a difference in the way um, black people are being treated, especially when it's being dealt with, you know, open racism, you know, and, and these situations not being openly addressed. Obviously, that is going to send anybody through the roof, you know. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if people like for instance when i heard the statistics that every 15 minutes you know there's a black person committing suicide i'm not surprised especially with what we see coming out of the us you know it's not doing anything great for the black community because if they feel like they don't stand a chance you know i heard of a story of a guy who had his backpack stolen and this guy went into prison and did, you know, life in, well, a certain number of years in prison. His whole life was taken away from him. And when he came out, he decided to commit suicide. It came out that this kid didn't even commit the crime that they professed he, he committed. And there's more and more of those situations coming out of the US. With the UK that I see, um i realized that we're experiencing right stealth mode racism and what do i mean when i say that the perpetrators refuse to acknowledge that they are racist when they clearly are we don't even have to get into it you know again it's bound to push people to put a rope through their neck and say that's it i, I want to end it but this show is not just about acknowledging what is going on in our societies, how we can prevent it, especially from the younger generation. Do you know what I mean? Uh, what, what, if any, what are the preventative measures? Um, just so you know, let me put the disclaimer, we could put in as much um, preventative measures as we want. If one is not able to acknowledge their own behavior it doesn't mean it's going to change so i just want to throw that out there um and to just also touch on a little bit of america i think america went through depression <laughs> um sitting under trump it's like every other day there was a problem we've never seen um our society in that state before okay um it was it came from a kumbaya <laughs> sort of setting under obama to the reality and what I mean by that is racism, whoever was racist or don't like black people, or don't like whatever, the darker skin, those things were always there. It was just camouflaged by who was in office. Okay, so we can't blame, to, fit, to be fair to Trump, we cannot blame him and say he made people race. People are who they are. It takes an environment, it takes a certain situation to bring out what's inside of you. If that's what's inside of you, that's what's inside of you. So I just want to throw that out there. We can put in the preventative measures, but just know not everybody's going to embrace those preventative measures because it always starts with us. What are we going to do with individuals? And what are we going to do? What are we willing to do to change ourselves to make the world a better place, so to speak, okay? So um, definitely the, the preventative measures that have to be put in place comes from a younger 
age. You may be in a home where racism is big, don't like black people, don't give them a break. When you see them, shoot them, spit at them, whatever the case may be, that's what the child knows. But when they go to school, and if there's enough um, information out there, right, that even though they are getting this from home, slowly their mindset will change because they're in an environment where it's said to embrace everybody. There's, there's enough room for all of us to live and live well. Okay? So sometimes you don't get that from home. You have to get it from the outside, you know, going to school, something. It's the law. You have to go to school. So if schools, um, communities, churches, stores will embrace that, it makes a big difference in how one may think. And there's many um, examples of that where, um, you know, the parents are still racist, but the child is now 17, 18, getting ready to go off to college. And they're now telling their friend, no, that's your way of thinking, but it's not mine. They're old enough now to speak to that parent. Sometimes, <coughs> um, bless you. Sometimes it's a case where um, um, I, when, when I was younger, I, was, um, I had a um, friend and he was... Um, he was, he is Caucasian, he's still alive, so he's Caucasian. But his dad was racist, racist as, and I'd say, but why do you want to be my friend? Like, you know, you need to, and I remember we were out in the city one day, and his father was in the same bar we were in at the Staten Island Church. I don't remember the bar at Staten Island. But, and his father was right there, and he did not care what he did while his father was watching just so that he could show his dad listen i am not for you in this on my end a little bit scary i must admit but at the same time he was making a statement that you know what i'm not in britain and, and to this day the man will only date he's married to a black woman mm -hmm. never date a white girl so the father you think you're telling your kid and pushing your kid one way you could send them over the, the other way you can't be that extreme in anything. In life, I've realized there's no absolute. Mm -hmm. There's no absolute. And our children will challenge us, right? And we must be careful how we hate. This is why hate should have no place in somebody's heart. Because when you hate somebody, right, and you put that off on your children, it's most likely going to backfire. Mm -hmm. And the very thing you hate is the very thing they're hiding from you. And when you hear the news, you might have heart attacks, okay? So we have to really be careful what we're putting out, <laughs> right? In, in, in our households, in the environment we work, in the people we come encounter with, mm -hmm. okay? And we have to be able to take that stand and um, not be afraid. If you know who you are, you're going to stand up for it. Um, prime example, this past summer, my, myself and my daughter, Abigail, we took a trip to Florida. And you know, right now, that's like a racist state, right? So, um, and, and I went with Naomi, also my two girls. And um, I was in the adult pool. I was in the adult pool. They were in the kitchen pool. And I was the only black one there. So now I'm surrounded by like 15 white people. And um, they're telling me, and because of my accent, of course, and because of some of the things I said, they obviously um, viewed me as a safe black Republican, which is good, right? Because I needed to get information out of them. So I really showed, um, highlighted the good points of Trump. So they're like, oh, this is safe. This is really safe. But what I was able to do in that is get my point across. If I just came in and said, no, I'm Democrat, I'm this, and he's this, I would have never gotten anywhere. <laughs> To the point, and these people are loud. I'm not talking about quiet people. These, you know, they, 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 they probably have the confession bag in their hotel room. But the point of the matter is because of the way how I was. Abigail was watching the whole thing. And I remember Abigail got out of her pool to come into the adult pool. So now she's the only child in the pool with us. And they said certain stuff to Abigail, and she just played right along with what they were saying. Like, yeah, rah, 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 Trump. But there was a point I was trying to make with them. And I was able to make that point. So you have to know your audience. 
and you have to know how to engage your audience, even when they're the opposite side, to the point where maybe almost 40 minutes into the conversation, I'm now able to say, this is who I am, this is what I represent, and you see, I'm going to say person for you to talk, so you don't have to beat up a part. If you saw me in the street, you don't know, you just see the black skin, you don't know if I'm from England, you don't know if I'm from Jamaica, you don't know if I'm American, or you see black skin. But after talking to me, they had a different perspective of who I was. I'm human just like you. I've got feelings just like you. I have a point of view just like you. And we both can play in the sandbox together nicely, get our point of view. And it's going to be okay. The sun will still rise tomorrow. So we really do have to know our environment in order for that to take place. But we also have to create that environment for others to know. Some people really don't know generally don't know. They really think we're apes or animals. We don't come from anywhere. We don't deserve anything. And sometimes it takes us, you know, just getting to know a person. Just I only had I only had a few hours to change the mindset of a few 15 people. Mm -hmm. Right? I could have taken a camera, I could have turned out of the pool, ran up to this and I'd yell at song, oh they're racist, they're gonna kill us. No, I took it from a standpoint. And then what it did is also, on the flip side of that, it showed Abigail that she also can stand up. Just because she's a teenager, she could also stand up and make a difference among her peers also. Because there's all sorts of things that will make people not like you, right? Um, when I was about 16, I got, I got a job working at the hospital. How did I get the job? They called me, I, I called for the advertisement on the phone, and um, the lady instantly, you know what, she didn't even pull me in to hire me, she said, you're hired, you're hired, you got the job, whatever I said, and, you know, enticed her to hire me. Um, I went there, got my uniform, I was working there two weeks, two weeks, and then she said, Tony, I want to take you out to lunch. I was working, so something was in this woman out, I was 16 years old. And she said, Tony, I'm taking you to lunch. And she got another one to fill my spot. Took me to the restaurant. And she said, Tony, I'm so embarrassed about what I'm about to tell you. She said, um, when I hired you a few weeks ago, I thought you were white. Mm -hmm. Okay, true story. <clears throat> I thought you were white because of your accent. She said, when I saw you coming, something in me wanted to say the job was taken. But I saw you coming with a smile. I, 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 I saw you, your bright spirit, your whimsical spirit. And I decided I'm going to close my eyes and hire you. In the last two weeks, it wasn't sitting good with me of the reason why I hired you. And I just wanted you to know this, that you're an excellent worker and such like that. And, you know, I thanked her for that information. I remember telling this story in college, right? And I remember the black people coming down on me, the black Americans. Are you crazy? She said, why did you say happy? Well, no, because that's where we lose out. That's where we're losing out as a society. You've got to be able to stand up and show who you are, right? Even when you're standing alone. I'm not saying the fight then, Brooke, I'm not gonna fight. Yeah, I think I can fight. My mama taught me how to fight. If we can say that for last, and we can change somebody's mind, we must be making a difference in this world. We're only here for a very, very short time, and we must be able to make some type of a positive difference, even with negative people. So those are the things that, and, and it's not too much. Again, I'm talking general. I don't want to get much into the specifics because then I'm going to leave a few people out, right? But just generally, we got to look in ourselves, but just create that environment change and show love and show kindness and show who we are just because you act a certain way I don't have to get down to the same level as you to make my point I mean it, again yeah, 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 exactly everything you said you know I recognize you know even here in the UK you know applying for certain jobs um, I, I did electrical engineering you know during my time went for certain jobs and to to be told that I was overqualified. I can be over damn qualified for a job. 
okay, pay me for the job, you know, I'm willing to take whatever payment. Well, we're going to have to underpay you and that's not going to sit well with us. I'm willing to take whatever you're offering. You know what I mean? Yeah. And this wasn't an isolated case. We went through this time and time and time and time again. But yet you're expected to smile and be diligent and not go through some sort of mental situation. Do you know what I mean? But somehow we got through it. You know, I always used to say, if the person caught me on the wrong day is getting it. <laughs> and and on top of it all, I felt like I was strong like Samson. I didn't give a damn. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So can you imagine how many people are, are walking around with that pent up, you know, uh, aggression, you know? I went through that time and time and time and time and time again. I was qualified. I got my certificates. But yet they're telling me, oh, you know, uh, sorry, uh, we got it wrong or the job was taken or whatever the situation was. It was always flimsy. It's no wonder, especially people here in the UK are walking around with mental situations. Do you know what I mean? And yet we, we find out that the system refuses to acknowledge what individuals are going through. They want to tell you that you're talking nonsense, that there's no racism or, or you couldn't have gone through that. Come on, I'm telling you what I went through. You see where I'm coming from? It's not yeah. being acknowledged. These same people are walking into relationships, which is not being acknowledged. And I heard what Sharon says, but also there's another side of that, you know, when it comes to relationships, we're also seeing women who are deliberately withholding children away from good fathers. How do I know? Because I know many of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking, how do we resolve these issues? Is it no wonder somebody like, for instance, you know, just piggy banking on what Sharon Mango said. I heard of a situation with a, a white couple and the wife was holding her children away from the man. Obviously, their, you know, relationship had come to an end. And this man went, you know, the family went on holiday together to, I think it was Barcelona or Spain, which one of the two, um, I know is in the same country, but... He jumped off the balcony with his two kids. You know? So we're looking at so many dynamics to mental health. I don't think we can fit it all in in one show. But um, I, I do want to, if I can, allow people to chime in on this conversation. What do you reckon, Sharon? Yeah, I think so too, because we can... We can talk about scenarios all day. However, if there is okay, a, well. if anyone there that wanted to chime in, you know, on the subject of mental health and the different degrees that we've been speaking of, please feel free. Um, mute. Yeah, please unmute and say what you want to say. Um, Vivian Montgomery, raise the hand if you would. Go ahead, unmute uh, Vivian, if you would. Hi, how are you? I'm Good, so thanks. I'm honored to be uh, part of this and listening. Um, my daughter was 15 and she suffered mental um, breakdown. She was put in a psychiatric ward for 30 days for suicidal ideations. And the child was in therapy since she was five years old. The therapist never picked up on it. She... Um, never expressed any outward um, signs that she needed help, except for a little anxiety that she would have until she was like 13 or 14 and she started to cut. And on the basis of what you just said about mothers were holding their children from fathers, I, I was separated, I was divorced actually when they were uh, three and two. And I, I was 
encouraging the children to see their father. And I was always like, you have to see your dad. You know, you have to have a relationship with your dad. Go visit your dad. And what came out of that um, situation was that her own dad molested her. Mm. And when you think you're on the mom and you're doing the right thing by encouraging those relationships to a dad that you think isn't a good dad, you still don't know what happens in, outside of your home. Yeah. And no matter how much I spoke to my daughter and my son about, you know, not being touched in the wrong places when they're young and all that stuff, mm -hmm. it still happened. And I still didn't find out until she was way older. So it's very hard to detect the mental health. To be mm -hmm. honest, I was a vigilant mom. I always asked them questions. I always look for signs. I always, you know, very open. And yet it was still very hidden in my own home with my own child that I was very close to. So um, are there ways to stop it? I don't know. Are there ways to avoid um, missing the mark? Yes. Um, would I have ever really known? I don't, I, I don't, she herself did not allow that part of herself to be known. So mm -hmm. how would I have seen it or heard or anything? All I heard was, I don't want to go to dad's. I don't want to mm -hmm. go there because I raised my children in a Christian home and he was not a Christian. He was doing things that were uncomfortable. So I would tell him, don't do that with your, when you're with the children, meaning like drinking and things like that. But I never saw anything else. I never thought anything else. So you just don't know. And I was not sure about um, antidepressants and, and drugs for a young child, but I realized that I had to give in and allow her to process her way, take the drugs, um, recoup, you know, um, get the help that she needed with school. Thank God she was in a small school and not a very big public school that we have here in the U.S. She was in a small, um, small all girls school that the teachers took interest and the therapist took interest in her and they would work with her. And if she needed a break, all she had to do was put a card on her desk and walk out, you know, so there are ways to get the help once, once the cry is there. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and thankfully now I, I that she was 15. I just want to say she's 21 now. She does not mind me telling her story, so I'm free to tell it. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's good now. She does no longer take medication. She, you know, we had the whole issue with the father and order protections and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. he didn't go to jail because it was a hearsay thing when she was a young girl, six years old. What we wanted was just to be away from him. And the courts granted that we have, we had order protection until she was 18. So the day that, that my, well, I live in New York city in New York and, um, my daughter was moving to Texas for school. The day that her order protection expired was the day that she actually got on the airplane and left. So it was perfect planning and how it worked out. And she never had to deal with him again. So, you know, it's very hard to diagnose all of those issues. And now that I look at my ex-husband, I see that he had mental health issues that he's trying to work through. Right. He was trying to work through things that happened in his childhood, things right. that he suffered. And he did not know how to process those things. Not right. that what he did was absolutely uh, appropriate, not at all. Um, but it's a pattern, like um, Dr. Tony was saying earlier, that's a pattern that they see, it's a pattern that they mimic, it's a pattern mm -hmm. that they do. And if you don't break that cycle, get the healing that you need physically, emotionally, trauma-wise with the right mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. then it can just continue to go on into a different cycle as the generations move forward or as society moves forward. Mm -hmm. So I think that having forums like this is very um, informative and, and helpful for others to try to maybe pick up little things and don't deny the little instincts that you may have about someone to make sure that you continue to reach out to them, see how they're doing, making sure that they are getting the help that they would require. And don't be so close-minded and thinking, well, that can't happen to my family, or um, I don't want my kid on drugs, so therefore I, I'm not doing that. Or I don't want my put my kid in therapy. What does that stranger know about my life and my family? Because a lot of times the children will speak to strangers more than they will speak to their family. No right. matter how diligent a mother or someone else would be like, 
talk to me. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm here to listen. I, I, I want it. I want to know. And, you know, they still yeah. may be closed with it, but you'll yeah. see outward signs. And my daughter, the outward signs was that she was physically cutting her skin and cutting her body. And that's mm-hmm. when I changed therapist right away and decided, okay, we need mm-hmm. a different path. And in that therapist is where she divulged what really happened or why she felt all this anxiety and this anxiousness. Mm-hmm. So it's a very uh, broad topic. Like Dr. Tony said in the beginning, there's a lot of layers to the mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's issues from trauma to, um, you know, from childhood to things that happen, you know, our, our bodies have cellular memory, trauma, cellular memory, there's PTSD. My daughter suffered a lot with PTSD. So you just realize those things. So you have to, if you don't seek help or if you don't, if you're not with somebody who has sought help, you kind of Mm -hmm. don't know that help is needed or required. Mm -hmm. So, um, never take it for granted is, is, is is my, um, my advice is never take it for granted, um, that you see somebody and you think that everything's all good all the time. My daughter was very smart, played all sports. She was high energy. She wasn't a depressive girl. She wasn't always hiding in her room. She wasn't none of those typical textbook um, depressive attitudes. Actually, it was totally the opposite. She was more outgoing and more everything than not. So that was very interesting because it wasn't textbook. It it wasn't like the the psychiatrist would notice or pick up on, you know? But other cues, other clues was what got me to say something else is wrong. And if you do have a good relationship with your child, eventually they will, they will divulge it. And she was more upset to divulge it because it hurt more because now it's out in the open. And like Dr. Tony said, and you guys have mentioned, no men, you know, they don't want to face that hurt and pain anymore. So it's hard to talk about it because you, you just want to be over it and done and, my daughter, when she exposed it, everything was in the open and it was like another raw experience all over again that she felt like I cannot handle this. And that's when she ended up in a psych ward for 30 days because she just could not handle it. She was done and she needed to be away from everybody to process all of a sudden reopening all these hurts that she always knew were there, but suppressed for, you know, 10 plus years of her life. So it's very difficult in a lot of aspects to see it, recognize it, understand the help and, you know, still love that person and still not also not be afraid of every time I I had to, I had to face the fact that I had to leave her alone, you know, had to go to work eventually. And, you know, my thought was always, Oh my God, what if she kills herself? What if she kills herself? What if she kills herself? You know, you had to let go of that fear too, in order for her to just grow, you know, and for her to just like, okay, mom, I'm good. I'm, I'm going to be okay. You know? So I, I let her go to college very far away. Texas is a very far away place from New York, but, um, I let her go despite everybody's um, opinion. Like how are you going to let her go so far? You know, you don't know what's going to happen out there, but she got better out there because she grew into herself. And she didn't have to face her father or the idea that maybe she'll run into him in the street or anything like that. And she was free to be herself and grow and change. Just like Sister Tony said, you know, you may be raised in a racist home and you finally realize who you are. And you're like, you know what? I don't have to be that person that my parents yeah. showed me or taught me. You know, I could be a, a, a different kind of person. And my daughter has learned to be a different kind of person to herself, you know, self, you know, they talk about self-love, but it's not about self-love. It's about knowing your awareness and taking care of yourself so that you're not continually abused, continue continue to be abused by those who abuse you, whether it's verbal or mental, I mean, verbal, mental, or physical, like Sister Tony said, they start off with that little bit of hair pulling or, you know, that little bit of, you know, nasty talk. The next thing you know, they're punching you or hitting you or doing worse. You know, so it's very true. It's very good to make our young girls aware of this, especially girls who have low self-esteem, that Mm -hmm. they are not to be controlled by a man, but men also get controlled by women. There's a lot of men that also get manipulated by women because of how they were brought up by their Mm -hmm. mothers or especially single, single mom households 
where mm-hmm. the mother was a, was everything. They were the they were the breadwinner. They were the domineering one. They were the single mom. They did everything. They were the strong mom. So these men don't have a father figure to understand that you know what their role is as a man in society in regards to you know providing for themselves, their family, others, and how to treat women or how to treat others. They don't have that role model because even if they go to school, a teacher's a teacher. You know, even if they go to church, a pastor's a pastor. Even if they go to a youth group or a youth group, you know, they need that. They need that. They need to see a life lived out in someone else and have the encouragement and the motivation and and the one on one to say, hey, what you're doing is not appropriate, and let me help you. Let me help you not to not to crash on a child's spirit, but to um, bring them up and enlighten them and show them a different way. Because all of us can all get better by just learning new things, right? So it's all about learning. But if we don't teach and if we don't have forums like this one right here that people can tune into, even if they tune into by accident, right. maybe stop and say, wait, what, what are they talking yeah. about? Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. And, you know, and then they'll yeah. continue listening and then they'll maybe realize I need help. I was an abused child from a stepmother, physical abuse. And by the time I was a teenager, I, I saw a, a, a show and it was about child abuse. And at the end, it shows a little phone number to call. And I, I was abused by my stepmother, but I lived, with, I lived with my mother at that time when I saw that movie. And I said to my mom, I was abused as a child. And my mother's like, well, then get help. You know, she couldn't face the, the fact that she knew, but she was out of control. She didn't have no control. I was full custody with my father. She had no control at that time. <laughs> And I went and I sought help, but I was already a a big teenager. You know, I was 19, but at least I had the awareness of, of, of a show, of a movie, of, or, or, you know, in my day, we didn't have podcasts, you know, there was no internet yet. So, but this forum, you don't know what your words and your platform will do to somebody. So I applaud you for this platform that you're doing today, because you don't know whose lives you're going to change. So I thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. uh, Powerful because she touched on so many different subjects and that was a big one. Vivian, again, thank you so much. We really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, I know that, you know, when, you know, of course we're putting this on YouTube, it's going to help somebody else. They're going to hear, see, and listen like, wow, that was me or that was my child or I went through that. It's, I mean, this, again, this subject, what Tenstar and I wanted to do today is, this is the different variations of mental health. You said something very um, big, baby, and I want to say this. When we look at abuse in whatever form, or mental health in whatever form, whether the, the abuser, I now, for myself, look deeper. This person did this to this person, but where is it coming from? He said, like your ex-husband, he was abused. It was never addressed. That is a real, real big problem in today's society. Like you, the first instinct is like, oh my God, he should be put away. It should be this. My instinct now is when you see these things, it goes much deeper. I'm looking way beyond because this, these things have never been addressed. And I, you know, it's not like you're sticking up for the individual. What they did was wrong. However, what happened to you? Why are you that way? Can they well, still be helped? They be well, re- well, well, one of the questions I would like to ask Vivian is, what lessons did you learn that you would like to impart into the atmosphere? So the lesson I want to um, say that I learned was that we really need to listen carefully, not just with our ears, but with our other senses. You know, watch, pay attention, listen more, and you know, don't be afraid to dig in a little deeper because that's where you'll see it and that's where you'll discover it and that's where you can get the help. 
I always knew as a child that I was not treated properly. Um, but as a child, I was stuck, right? I only had so much resources. And when I brought it to my mother's attention, her, her feeling was like, well, there was nothing I could do and that's it. You know, mm -hmm. she would have just said, I'm sorry, let's get your help now. It would have changed everything. So as a parent, you know, don't be afraid to tell your children you're sorry. Don't be afraid to ask for forgiveness from your child because that is a healing bomb to their soul to not think that their parent just ignored what happened to them. When I was involved with the authorities, they told me, I'm very proud of you because most mothers do not stick up for their children. Mm -hmm. Most That's mothers right. will be afraid of the abuser or, or they're afraid of their circumstance and want to stay there. Did I want to think that my ex-husband that I knew for 20 years did that to my own child? No. But mm -hmm. if my daughter said that, I had to pay attention mm -hmm. and I had to listen. And did, was there a little doubt? Yes. What if she's lying? What if she's just saying this for attention, right? There was that little doubt because how could I think that my ex-husband that I've known since I was 20 years old and now I'm 40 could do that to his own flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. But I had to step outside and really look at her life, how she grew up and remember things that she said mm -hmm. to then say, okay, I'm going to take a stand for her. Because even if in the end she was lying, they would find out. The attorneys were very good at that. The district mm -hmm. attorneys were very good at finding out. But she was not lying. And despite that, everybody else in the family wanted to think that she was lying, his side, I knew that she wasn't. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. Um, you have to be willing to stand up and not worry about the backlash. Mm -hmm. yes. And as a, as a wife of a narcissist, the same husband, right? You have to realize that you have, you have a voice and you have power and you are not to be abused or treated a certain way. And it, I understand that as I was molded, he was 10, 11 years older than me. So I was 20 years old when I met him, 21. So he was able to mold my me because I was impressionable. I was not, um, I did not have high self-esteem of myself. So he used that platform in me to raise me the way he wanted to. And it wasn't until I got out of the relationship that I realized, oh, wow, that was not a good relationship. But mm -hmm. it wasn't that there wasn't people telling me that it wasn't a good relationship, but I wasn't listening. I didn't listen to myself. We have to listen. So when you hear other young women or other people talk about their relationships, really pay attention and teach them that there's a way out while they're young and while they can, because otherwise they'll get sucked into that very, very easily. So, um, and as far as children, children love their parents, you know, par parents will hit them and, and, and discipline them in harsh ways sometimes and they still love their parents there's there is a thing that they they love their abusers they they don't understand they just want the love they just want the attention and even if that if it's a negative attention or a bad attention there's still something missing obviously in that um but we have to nurture that and even if it's not our own children but we see others in our community in our society we work with children you know, make sure that it's an address in a proper way so that the child could get the help that they need. Because yes, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of negative um, connotations to those things, right? Social services and stuff like that. But some kids do need to be removed from homes. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of negativity against the parents that they're not, un they're unfit parents. And some are and some aren't. When I had to go through that, I had social services in my home every week for two years to check up on me. And I was not the accused or the abuser, but they were coming to my home and making sure that my daughter was okay. And mm -hmm. it's, it's frustrating and it's a little disheartening, but you have to put up with it and be strong so that you can get through the process of it all. So yes, the process is hard. It's not easy. You have to face it as a mother, as a parent, as a self, as a child to work through it so that you could be ultimately the person that you were created divinely to be in a society that deserves a good, honest, loving person to not carry on these traits. So honestly, just listen, hear, watch, 
Don't just listen with your ears, listen with your eyes. Look at the people that are around you. Pay attention to their little words and let it sink in and figure out how you can help or get them help. And pay attention. Really, honestly, you have to look at everybody around you. Vivian, thank you so much for sharing your story, for being brave enough to even come on camera and, and share your story. Many would have shied away from it, but we thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I would like to ask you before you go, um, would you like to see more of a show like this on this platform? Absolutely. Um, it's it's evident now, especially after COVID, there is a lot of depression. There is a lot of anxiety. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty that is going on. There's a lot of division in the world. So it does, like Sister Tony said earlier, even environmental stressors, you know, like these storms and things that are going on, people are, people are dealing with a lot of different things. And it's not just an abuse mental illness like you know normal things that we think about but also just right. normal anxiety these college kids come out of school they don't know what to do with their lives they're hearing this hearing that parents are teaching one way society's teaching another they don't know what's right or what's wrong so all of these um avenues especially for um today's generation that podcast and um youtube and these social media platforms are so eminent you don't know who it's going to touch. You don't know who's going to scroll on it or who's going to share it or who's going to say, hey, I heard something. Maybe this will help, you know, and it may not be, it, it, it'll be less offensive because it's coming from, let's say, an, a, a conference or in a situation like this instead of that person talking in their ear, but they could share it and all of a sudden they're like, you know, maybe that's me, you know, right. maybe I do need help or maybe my my past or was not exactly how it should have been or maybe my child was help. So, you know, absolutely. These forums, I think, are 100% amazing in the social media aspect, YouTube or whatever your platform may be, because, like I said, um, people are more apt to listening to strangers on, on, on their telephone where they feel safe, right? Society feels safe in this right now. They think that this is this is okay. I could talk to this because it's not a real it's not a real relationship. But you don't. This can influence you in a negative way mm -hmm. or in a positive way. Right. So right. your platform is a positive platform. Continue to share it. Continue to speak on it. Don't don't shrink back from it because there's a lot of aspects to it. Thank you so much, baby, and God bless you. Thank you. And uh, thank, you. thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes. We're going to come to somebody else. If anybody else would like to say something, we want to give you that opportunity to share your story, you know. Um, anybody else would like to say anything about mental health um, or on any anything you've heard so far? If not, then we shall proceed. Uh, Dr. Tony, what have you heard so far, for, especially from Vivian? Um, this is my girl, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> my sister. But um, we um, and she's fantastic, and I thank God, and I really ask her to come and make sure she does um express um, you know, her, her her interest in this because it's quite important. And no man's an island. I don't want to be on it by myself because there's other people that's coming with a wealth of knowledge also. Um, so um. It's really important for the, I didn't want to go into anything else but stick to the general because that's what I was asked to speak upon, right? But just to, um, just touch on it just a little bit so people could get an understanding. We um, parents who um, know something's going on with um, another parent, and choose not to say anything, or really sincerely don't know, right? Um, and it's been brought to our attention. What we must do is, in order to help our children, we must be able to recognize that um, we did know or we didn't know, we didn't do anything about it, we don't want to take it seriously, but forgive ourselves, 
acknowledge the truth so that we can help our children to get through what they need to get um, That's just uh, the long and short of it. A lot of times it happens because of our pride, we don't want to talk about um, certain aspects that in our lives. Um, my children will tell you, my, my life isn't open, but my children can tell you anything at any time. Sometimes I even forget what I told them and they'll sit down and finish the story for me. That's what I want. That's what I want because I've, I've, I've said from a young age, a very, very young age when I started to um, have children, I've told my children from a younger age, mm -hmm. other people that I grew up with. Even if I was a prostitute and I gave up that life, if you start telling your kids from that age you were a prostitute, when they hear it outside, they go back, <laughs> you know what I mean? So you have to be honest with what we've gone through in order to, to help our children get to a level, um, as Vivia said, you know, with their daughter, the, the, the independence and stuff like that. Because, um, again, we're only here for a short time. Mm -hmm. And we have to be able to um, be honest with ourselves and be honest with the people that we say we love mm -hmm. so that we're able to help others um, move from A to B. I mean, just because I could speak on it now, I, in, in fact, I fell on becoming a doctor. It's not like I went, I don't want to be a doctor. No, it's because of what I was personally going through. And I'm like, you know what? Let me go to school to learn more about what my situation is, mm -hmm. right? And then I went and I got my master's and after that, and then I went and got my doctorate. It wasn't something because I aspired to get my doctorate. Into no, absolutely not. I just did it for my own self and I can tell you who, who doesn't know I'm going to reveal it now Sharon's my sister okay Miss Mango's my sister so we're quite um, close but there's a lot of days where I relied on her to get me through some dark times when I was going through my situation right and she would you know she would talk me through it sometimes the way she talks she'd laugh me through it because she's so funny when she, when she talks sometimes but I do appreciate that. And what I can say is people, always, I, I get comments all the time, compliments all the time about how well together I am. Oh, you well put together. No, that's got nothing to do with it. It's a process. It's a process. I've gone through it. Um, depression, you know, my children, I've seen my children, some aspects of um, depression. And even touching on how do we cope when we're in depression? Not just going to the go-to pill. It's the weed smokers. It's the alcohol drinkers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's the over sex folks. It's the overeating folks. Which I do like chocolate. So, you know, I can say I'm part of it. But the point of the matter is we have to be able to recognize and meet people where they are. Okay. I haven't smoked weed in my life. I smelt it all through my life. Never, never actually smoked it. Right? Growing up, it wasn't something that what my father did. Right? He had his own goal. It wasn't weed. But the point of the matter is when I got my own little household, I'm like, mm, no. Mm, 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 mm. Until I realized I got some kids coming up. I can't control my kids. But I recognize that's their coping. Right? And that's their generation coping. Not every child is doing it, but we have to learn to recognize how are folks coping in depression? Is it destructive? That's another level we don't really want to talk about. I mean, even, I, I, like I said, I try to keep it to just general depression. But even talking about young girls who've been molested and raped by their fathers, their biological fathers, then I got to deal with them when they're a mess. And guess what? Guess what they're out there doing? They're prostituting. So I could talk to this 15-year-old about why she's prostituting. It took a long while for me to even process, well, if she was raped by her dad, why is she prostituting? That was part of her coping. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Now everybody's going to say, "Oh, I don't, I'm, I'm going to run from it." No, every individual is different, mm -hmm. right? It's just mm -hmm. like you're being abused, so you get up and you abuse, or you choose not to abuse. Yeah, but yeah. that's a coping mechanism that people use mm -hmm. to get through whatever they need to get through. Because again, we're trying to avoid that pain, and we're seeking for some type of a pleasure, right? To get away from that because we don't want to address it. So it goes deeper than just, again, just general. We have to look at what young people, after adulthood, what are we doing to cope with 
what we're going through, yeah. right? And so, it, and, and that's just to embrace everybody. Mm -hmm. Not my point of view, not your point of view, but there's a whole slew of people out there that the, the panel that we have today, where, who, who they're representing, who they go back and tell that story to, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to just be mindful of that and just meet people where they are and be very yeah. careful not to be biased, put our own opinion in it, yeah. right? And then just meet people where they are so we can help them go through the stages of what they need to go through to get where they need to go so that they're independent enough to be yeah. a productive citizen of society. Everything doesn't have to be a death sentence, right? right? And, um, you know, we just have to, like now weed is legal, but now they upped it. Now they're lacing it with the coke. So even though now we've made weed legal, others have put other thing in it to just um, enhance that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's always more and, um, you know, more things that people are coming up with on how to cope. Because now, now weed is legal. The thrill of smoking weed is really out of it. So you got to get to the about that thrill. Yeah. What am I going to do that? I, you know, so you, it, it's, it's a bunch of things we have to look at. It's not just one. Yeah. Wow. Dr. Grant, God bless you and thank you for being here today. This is going to be a regular feature, your family on this show. Um, and we're going to require your services more and more. I think, Sharon, we, we're going to do this every fourth week, you know maybe towards the end of the last week in november will be the next show um even if because me and you have spoken even if this show helps us one person then it's well worth it 100 yeah over to you well um so my my sister revealed i was not gonna say anything but yes she Dr. Tony Grant is my biological sister. She is my little sister. We all grew up in England together. So we know we've been through it. We've definitely been through it and seen some things, racism and abuse. We've been through it. We've seen it. I've helped her through her struggles. Um, and I guess that's a topic for another day. However, um, this is something that we need to do. Vivian, we want to thank you for coming on because, again, if it touches one person, then we've done our due diligence on, you know, we've done our due diligence on, on, on raising the awareness on this particular subject. Again, there's so many different dimensions. And again, it is a topic for another day because we have so much to say. Um, we, we're really hoping that, you know, in this discussion that people have a better understanding of depression and anxiety, um, the difference and looking at people differently. I have to bring Vivian's name in again because it's situations like that that's also rampant. And unfortunately, um, people are not understanding of the hows and the whys or what signs to look for. It's it's difficult at best because your daughter did not exhibit the, you know, yeah. the traditional signs. Um, I got to speak on, you know, a subject for, for myself, like a family member on my, my husband's side. And, you know, my husband and I have been together for quite some time, 15, 16 years. And, you know, knowing that, uh, a specific individual in the family that I've known that's shown me love from the first day I even met Elliot. And um, not seeing, did not fully understand the extent of this individual's depression. Um, still bothers me today, it wasn't that long ago that this happened. Um, and he decided to take his life. He has a beautiful family, these kids are all grown. I still struggle with it because I was with him the week before and the week we decided not to go drive the two hours up that week we didn't go was the, the opportunity that he had to take his life he was going through things that we 
didn't understand. Tried to talk to him. He didn't say a whole bunch. And he's always a talkative person. But the week before, I saw a little decline in this individual. And but still showed love, always hugging me, kissing me. I cut his hair that weekend. Shag, could you cut my hair and spruce me up a bit because visitors were coming? Yeah, sure, Uncle Steve, no problem. No, no that was the last time I was going to see him. And this was a grown man. So the signs, it's hard to detect. I suspected, but I didn't know how deep rooted it was. And that's um, it at the end of the day. Kind of reminds me of the comedian who took his life for the kind of like the same Ro Robin, what's his name? Robin Williams, yes. Yeah. Yes. Robin Williams. That bothers me also, yes. Loved him. As Didn't well as the, uh, the young lady, the Miss America. Yes, yeah. Miss America. Yeah. Right. yeah. And Winona Ryder's mother, right? Is that my sister, right? Yes. Winona Ryder. Yes. There's tons. So this, this subject, this subject is something we want to keep going because while this may be on a small scale, believe me when I tell you, we're touching somebody and that somebody's going to touch somebody like, hey, you might want to look at this. Hey, you might want to listen to this. Yeah. If this becomes a therapy session, although we are not trained, we're not Dr. Tony, but um, if this is a therapy session for people to, 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 to express themselves, let this platform, platform be that. Let it be that because, again, Dr. Tony has expressed, we only appear for a short space of time. While we're here, we want to make sure that we affecting people on a larger scale. We want to know that as Christians or whatever religion that you are, that we have extended that hand. Hey, listen, I hear you want to talk about it and i'm good for that if my sister knows that i'm good for that you can put my ears off but i do have a word for you yeah and so does 10 star and so does people like vivian there's always somebody's situation maybe more worse than the other and just you talking about it and addressing it and making them feel welcome like it's okay to be yourself it's okay to express yourself we're here to listen. What can I do? What do you? What would you like to see me do? What can I do for you? This is why we wanted to do the subject today. And as you can see, I'm very passionate about it because I've seen things happen. I'll touch on another individual. We is actually a friend of Elliot's, and I met Elliot through this friend, and known him for a number of years, and didn't know what his issues were, didn't know it was so deep rooted. And he went and he took something. I don't think he knew what would happen to him, but he went into a coma. We just, we lost touch, just heard he was in a coma. By the time we got to the hospital, we had security block us until this guy's mother came and saw who we were. And like, oh, it's Elliot and Sharon, come in. And we went in and this guy was out tubes hooked up everything <laughs> and it was sad to see this because i knew this guy he was funny vibrant and i promise you it was a difficult thing to see but my husband and i went in again it was really his friend and he just kept talking to him i'm talking about he was in a coma he kept talking to him and talking to him and just making jokes remember when we did this remember when we did that and believe me when I told you, his eyes opened. The tube was stuck. Of course, not stuck, but the tube was down his throat. He had a trach in. And he opened his eyes and he's got big eyes and he, he needed his glasses. So we, he was kept motioning to us. And he was in a coma for a few days until we got there. He woke up hearing our voices and asked for pen and paper scribbling he needed his glasses he was drawing all kinds of things because they took his glasses he couldn't see you know he came out of that coma he came out of it and walked out of that hospital and called us about a week and a half later and said i heard you guys talking to me and i'm so grateful you were there you guys pulled me out of the coma 
months later, Valentine's Day, probably two months later, we just got the call. He was gone. The stresses that whatever it was pulled him back in. Mm -hmm. Valentine's Day, we got the call. He was gone. Just when we thought we could help. So this is bigger than all of us. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than all of us. And I'd like to see us really come together because again, this is a, a small scale, but this will grow for people wanting to express themselves. This is a safe house for you to express yourself. And well, I, I, I absolutely feel like, you know, um, this show is gonna do wonders. Uh, Sharon and I, even before I started this podcast, I said to myself, this is the difference that I wanted to bring in and I brought it to your attention and me and you discussed it, you know, and um, even though we've done the first series today, I feel encouraged to continue it. So maybe we're at the, like I said, at the end of each month, we're going to bring this show. So if you believe in the show, we'd love for you, if you believe in it, to just share it with whoever you feel needs to hear these kind of shows. There's so many layers to mental health. I really want to get to the length and breadth of it with Dr. Grant and uh, to talk about the many different. So maybe next time we can talk about this solely on relationships and, and you know, what are we missing? What should we looking out for? You know, I for one, I'm very, I've always been very attentive to my daughter. I told her, I, I've even given my daughter a special phone ring. When I hear that ring, I know it's her, <laughs> you know? And she can call me like 50 times in a day, like yesterday she called me and she was crying her eyes out. And I had to come to the hair doctor. <laughs> Sharon Mango. I said, you gotta help me out here. She's having a bad hair day. And she was able to help me through it. But this is how I try to be attentive to what she said. What are you talking about? You got a hair problem. What's wrong with your hair? I can't see nothing wrong with it. Sharon, you got to help me out here. What's going on? And that's how I train myself to be, to be more attentive to, to whatever she's going through. I hope these shows will help many of us, not just one or two. But we're going to do it at the end of each month. You know, so we'll do it. The next show will be, I think, the end of November. Sound good, Sharon? Sounds good to me, uh, Dr. Tony. What do you Tony think? Grant. Dr. Tony Grant, where I say. Tony Grant, what are you saying? What do you think about that? No, the, tell them, where I say, where I say. I think it's, I think it's um, very good. Um, I think it's very important and needed. Um, so, mm. uh, uh, and I know my friend Vivian was trying <laughs> to come on because she has lots of good things um, to say and she's an influence in the community um, and um, I think that um, it can only get better um, once we put hands and heart together to, we're not going to solve every problem so don't get to the extreme but we just need to be a willing vessel to help where we can help and recognize our limitations and even if it's at a different level, we can actually be a service to get people the deeper help that they need. But we, 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 we share an agreement that this is needed. And when we're under one accord, it can only get better from here. So, yeah. And Vivian, you know, you're always invited back. We will always include you know that because... You, you know, your testimony today was, is, is spoke volumes and um, it will definitely touch other people who's been in the situation and, and still going through it and not knowing how to deal with it. So we 100% include you as family right now, the SBRB family, we, we include you. And, um, you know, thank you for your service and helping the community as well, because it's needed. It takes a village. They say it takes a village to raise our kids, but it takes a village to help each other. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right? 
Absolutely. It takes a village for us to help each other. It's always a hand, this hand helping this hand. We need that. Right. We need that. Karen, can you see a message by Vincent? Yes, Vincent stated, um, Vincent says he knew a bright and intelligent girl. She went to a top college. It was a mental issue as such due to the excruciating pain during her men menstrual cycle monthly. Her way of dealing with it, she jumped to her death. She ended a life. To hear that, Vincent. Yeah, but again, there it is. There's so many, this, this, it's a lot. But I think it's, it's to keep having these conversations and I know there's many, there's many going around. And that's a good thing. We want to be a part of that many and even hopefully to, to make a I guess change. it would create the awareness. Yeah, it will spark the awareness. Yeah, it's, it's sparking the awareness within yeah. our surroundings. Mm -hmm. Hey, tell your friend, log in. You yeah. never know. Yeah. And this is what it is. We're raising the awareness in our own communities and bringing it to this forum for people to express. Yeah. How they're feeling or what they're going through yeah. or the family members. This it's needed. 100 yeah. percent Yeah. <laughs> well, Sharon, we're gonna end the show today. We'll be back in a month's time. Well, let's say at the end of November. Mm -hmm. We'll give people enough notice. If you believe in the show, just let people know about this platform. Mm -hmm. uh, you can add Sharon on. Where can people add you on social media? On social media, I am on Facebook, um, Sharon Mango, because I am the original Sharon Mango. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we got to drop that in there, original Sharon Mango. But no, just Sharon Mango on Instagram, on Facebook. I think I'm Sharon Mango on Twitter. I'm going to have to start using my Twitter so I can get the messages out there as well. Um, but yes, please reach out to me link me um this of course will be on youtube um so please like share and subscribe if you don't mind that'd be wonderful share 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 and uh you can catch me on 10 star nehemiah general that's 10 star nehemiah general you can catch me on um either facebook or um Instagram, yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you can catch me on both of those platforms. Okay, so mm -hmm. we'll be back here tomorrow. I'm not going to tell you who we are going to be having a conversation with, but I can tell you this person is a legend of the highest degree. So we're going to be back yeah. here tomorrow. If you want to join us, feel free. We'll be back here tomorrow, same time, 4 p.m. If you're in the UK. If you're in America, like New York, Florida, New Jersey, 11 a.m., Jamaica, 10 a.m., okay? And if you're in Germany, 5 p.m., okay? So we're going to be out of here. I'm not going to play any music. We're just going to get out of here neatly. Dr. Grant, thank you very much. We appreciate your presence and your information and your knowledge. Uh, Vivian, God bless you. Thank you for creating that awareness, and we'd love to see you back here again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. God bless everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. And blessings to all who logged on, who stayed in, and, and just beautiful. Thank you so much for supporting us. Bye.